best. And I looked deep into me and, and asked myself, what is it that you know how to do best? And for those of you who have ever built software at the magnitude of SAP software, you know that what we do is we break very big questions into tiny questions and solve every one of them and reintegrate them together. And so I said, I'm a great integrator. And when I put the two together, I figured out it's really hard to solve peace in the Middle East with a technological integration solution. But I looked at the first country that actually signed a peace treaty without a reason to sign a peace treaty with Israel was the Emirates. And what I saw is a country that's running off oil. They had a horizon. They knew that within a certain number of years, they will not be on oil anymore. And so they decided to diversify out of oil. And then you go into banking, into media, into tourism, into education, and what you get is a modern society, one that does not need oil in order to thrive. And modern societies become democratic, and as they become modern, the last thing they want is war. So I figured out, if we can somehow land oil within a 15-year horizon, not end it in one day, you will get more countries in the Middle East that will become modern over a 15-year period, and they'll sign a peace treaty, and we'll get peace in the Middle East. How do you run a country without oil? I then ended up in an Al Gore presentation a few months later, and I figured out the other side of that coin is if you end oil, you save 20% of the carbon emissions on the planet. That would be good. Then we only need five more better places, and we're good. Um, I started down that path, and I figured out it's bound to be biofuels, right? Because we can't change the infrastructure. There's a monopoly on energy that comes into a car. It's liquid form. It has to be in liquid form. All cars come in liquid form. Energy input, better find a liquid molecule that will run all the cars in the world. Read everything about it, then figured out in six months, we just don't have enough to scale to serve that industry. The U.S. has put $90 billion of incentives into ethanol. In today's world, the U.S. serves five days' worth of its oil supply from ethanol. The other 360 come from the ground. You know how we, we usually forget that it's 365 days a year? We say 360 days a year. It's the five days we forget that we can do on liquid ethanol. So then I figured out it must be hydrogen, right? We were told the hydrogen economy is coming, the hydrogen economy is coming. We put all these incentives into the, we built hydrogen cars. Until you realize the science breaks, right? The science of hydrogen is kind of the stupidest thing we've ever done in our lives. You take an electron, you package it with a proton. Sorry for going scientific on you for a second in the middle of lunch. But the proton is about 2,000 times bigger. You ship it. We don't know how to, but we'll build something that will ship it. Then we figure out we'll take the proton away in the car and we'll use the electron. Until you realize we've built the biggest machine on Earth called the electric grid that knows how to ship electrons without packaging them with protons. Why would you do that? You don't solve an energy problem. You're actually creating an energy problem. And then I said, well, if we have the grid, let's go build an electric car. And then the next question hits you. How do you make an electric car that will be one that every single person on this planet want to buy on their own, without a man, without a force that tells them that's the only car you can buy? And it translated into the following hypothesis. A person coming into a dealership will pick the most convenient car that is the cheapest to buy and will then be willing to pay as much as they pay for petrol on a per kilometer basis. I'll repeat it again. You go into a dealership, you got two cars. One is expensive, the other one not. One is convenient, the other one not. You'll pick the convenient, cheap car. And then you'll pay whatever you pay for petrol to drive it. Sounds sort of simple, right? It ends up that everybody in the industry went the other way. We were told that there were electric cars all over the place, electric vehicles, we called them, because they weren't really cars. 
and yet nobody wants to buy them. Now what is an electric vehicle? It's usually confined by the size of the battery. It's small, then it doesn't have a lot of power, it doesn't go too far, it doesn't have a place to charge, and so you're asked to buy a two-seater that goes about 70 kilometers an hour in a car that really won't protect you if you get into a car crash, and it will only go about 50 to 60 kilometers on a charge, and there's no way, no way to charge it. But you have to pay $40,000 to buy it. And people are kind of surprised that nobody wants to buy them. So we said we have to figure out a way within the science we have on the shelf today, so it's the next level of question, to build a car that is more convenient than the average consumer car, the Chevy Malibu if you want, and that is cheaper to buy than the average gasoline car, petrol car, and build a business that will sell kilometers to those cars and will make good margin. Because if it doesn't make good margin, charity will run out. And that business is better place.